to admit I'm a little nervous that the children are out there because I know there are a bunch of cookies and I know I know I delivered some of them and Emily told me thou shalt not steal any of them. Same with the kids. I stole some from the cookie dough pile. Uh, this morning we will read from chapter 5 of the book of James, verses 7 through 12. And you can find that on page 1885 in the Bibles in your pews. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is read. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Do not grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider them blessed, those who have persevered. You have heard of Job, per, Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else, let your yes be yes, and your no be no, or you will be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we are looking at the final chapter of James and our last sermon in this series. Throughout this series, James has reminded us that while we are indeed saved by faith, we are not absolved from proving that our faith is real and alive by our actions. This morning's passage is a call for us to demonstrate patience. I am very thankful that all of you stayed for worship after seeing the sermon title, Demonstrate Patience, in your bulletin. I know that Paul declares patience to be part of the fruit of the Spirit. However, it is a fruit that many of us, including myself, would prefer not to have to exercise. When I was a lay person, any time I saw that the pastor was going to be preaching, preaching on patience, my excitement for that service decreased greatly and I was looking for any sort of an excuse to not even be at the uh, service at the time of the sermon because I did not want to hear about having to have patience. However, it is in Scripture and we do need to take it into consideration. In verses 7 and 8, James asks us to consider the farmer. As most of you know, since I know most of you have at least some background in ranching and farming, the farmer waits for both the early rains and the late rains. He waits for them knowing that the rains are the key to the success of his or her crop. Just as the farmer is patient and waiting for the rains to come so his seeds would flourish and produce, James is telling us we need to be patient for the second coming of the Lord. James continues his call for us to be patient in awaiting for the Lord's return by assuring us that the Lord's uh, coming is near. Because it is near, we need to stand firm in our faith. Now, I know for non-believers, hearing that the second coming of the Lord is near is kind of hard to believe. After all, 
It's been about two millennia since Christ's death and resurrection. And in what world is 2,000 years a short time? While James does not address this question, Peter does in his second letter address the issue. He declares, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. And that's 2 Peter 3, 9. For those of us who are running out of patience, waiting for the return of the Lord, Peter gives us a simple solution. If we want to speed up the coming of the Lord, we should be out in the world sharing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, and we should be working towards the repentance of everyone. In verse 9, James continues his instructions by telling us not to grumble against each other. Thanks, James. It's bad enough that you put in patience, but now you're saying, don't grumble. In this prohibition, he is once again actually requiring us to demonstrate patience. John Calvin, in his commentary on James, sees the writer of this letter instructing us to be willing to bypass offenses perpetrated against us by others. Remember, our Lord has instructed us that we are not to judge, and when we are grumbling, we are judging. When we are grumbling against people, we are violating God's commandment that we are not to judge one another. James continues by reminding us that the judge is near. He is so near that he is actually at standing at the door. Instead of grumbling, we should be exhibiting patience. As a commentator that I read points out, there is no benefit in grumbling. And I think many of us recognize the truth of this uh, statement as well. I love it. I'll often walk up to somebody and say, so, how's it going? Many times, the response I hear is, can't complain. After all, it wouldn't do any good anyway. Isn't that an admission that our grumbling doesn't do any good? And if that's the case, the question should be asked, why are we wasting our energy grumbling in the first place. Starting in verse 10, James provides two examples of people who have demonstrated great patience. The first example are the prophets from the Old Testament. One does not need to read too far in the stories of these prophets to learn that they had a great deal of patience. These prophets suffered greatly in proclaiming the word of God. The reason why they ended up suffering was that they were either preaching the word of God's rebuke to people in power, or they were preaching that God disapproved of what the society valued and what the society was practicing. Either way, their lives were often in danger. James points out that in spite of all of their suffering, we consider them to be blessed. Now, just as a little aside, Lord, um, you know, I really don't need to be blessed in the same way that you blessed the prophets. You know, I can do without all of that suffering. The other example James uses is Job. And I know most of us are pr pretty familiar with Job's story because I recently did a series on that book. We might be surprised that, that Job
James is using Job as an example of patience, we might want to point out to James that, you know what, as we read the book of James, he did a lot of grumbling to God. Also, James, remember, he pointed out on two separate occasions that he wanted to serve God. However, the key to remember here is that he was taking his complaint directly to God and was not grumbling against his fellow person. One commentator even argued that Job's grumbling was more along the lines of trying to figure out what was wrong with Job's picture of God. Job seems to admit that, or James seems to admit that Job did indeed uh, struggle greatly. However, the writer wants us to also look at the end of the story of Job. In the last chapter of that book, we see that God blesses Job's later life by giving him twice as much as he had during the first part of his life. Furthermore, the struggles that Job went through actually increased his knowledge of the Almighty. When we are going through tough times, it is often because God is using those tough times to enable us to grow in our faith. Finally, in verse 12, James takes up the issue of swearing. That prohibition is found in the Old Testament. For example, in Exodus 20, we are instructed not to take the Lord's name in vain. <clears throat> Every time I see that prohibition, I flash back to a bumper sticker that I saw back when I was in college that declared that God's last name is not damn it, even though it seems like many people think it is. Furthermore, in Leviticus 19, we see a prohibition against swearing falsely. There was a general understanding in Judaism that swearing by God or by the name of heaven where God resided was forbidden. There was a practice at that time, however, that people would swear by the earth. This was an attempt to get around the mandates found in scripture that we were not to swear by God or by heaven. After all, the earth isn't heaven and it isn't God. However, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount expanded the Old Testament prohibition against swearing. He tells us we are not to swear by either heaven or by earth. The heaven part was already established by Jewish tradition. You didn't swear by heaven because that was uh, God's home. But Jesus says, and you don't swear by earth because that is God's footstool. Jesus and his half-brother James state out that there is a flat-out prohibition against swearing, period. Both of them declare that our reputations should be such that whether we say yes or no, our word is reliable. If we need to add an oath to our promises, what does that say about our trustworthiness? Especially when we don't follow it up by taking an oath. Are we saying that our word is our bond only when we back it up by an oath? I sure hope that is not the case. This statement against taking oaths have caused some Christians to object to taking an oath when they take the witness stand in court. Many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with the old Perry Mason TV show where the witness is sworn in by having raising their right hand and having the bailiff ask, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You 
usually followed by, so help me God. Fortunately, the courtrooms of the United States have changed that oath to have us either solemnly affirm or some leave the option to swear that the testimony we are about to give is the truth. I personally do not see a problem of taking an oath in the courtroom. That is a unique setting where not everyone who takes the witness stand follows the same code of conduct that we do. As a result, it is necessary to affirm that we are going to be truthful in our testimony. I believe that Scripture's prohibition against swearing has more of an everyday application to it. But to those whom we see and work with on a daily basis should be able to hold our trustworthiness in such high esteem that we do not need to say anything more than either yes or no. If those who know us best need more than just our simple statement to trust its truthfulness, we have a serious problem with our own trustworthiness. As we come to the end of our sermon series on James, I want to take just a moment to review what this letter has taught us. It is true that James indeed has set the, a high standard for us to achieve. In the first chapter, we found that we were to be joyful in the midst of our trial. Then we are told that we need to make sure that our works demonstrate the faith that we profess. We were told that we need to control our tongues, even though that is more difficult than taming most of the large beasts on the earth that we have already tamed. Finally, this week, we are told that we need to de demonstrate patience and stand firm in the faith as we await the second coming of the Lord. As we approach the Advent season, which starts in two weeks, let us remember that indeed we have a Savior who was born in a manger in Bethlehem. This Savior, Jesus, came to cleanse us from our sins and enable us to have a righteousness that is based on faith in Christ, not on our works. While it is true that we are saved by faith, let us constantly be reminded that we are called to be lights shining into a world of darkness. As James declares, if our faith is not producing fruit in keeping with our light, our faith is dead. Let us always make sure that we are producing works that demonstrate that our faith is alive, even if that requires us to demonstrate patience. Amen.